Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just going to sort of wait a few moments while um, people kind of gather in the waiting room um, and then we'll kind of introduce people. Uh, one of the things that I um, will kind of go through as well, I think it's quite good once you kind of um, are in the Zoom, you'll see that there, if you haven't attended one of these before, you'll see that there's two areas at the bottom. One is the Q&A function and the other is the chat function. Please do feel free to add in any chat as the um, webinar goes on. And um, when either Scott or James mention something, um, if there is a link to it, we will probably put it there as well so that it's accessible for you. So if a book or um, a program or something is mentioned, we'll try and add it to that as we go on. Um, in the Q&A function, if you have a question for our panelists, please do put them um, there and to, at the end sort of we'll have sort of 10-15 minutes towards the end of our talk and um, Gillian, uh, my colleague Gillian Pinkham will have a little look through and highlight any questions that we maybe haven't sort of spoken about during the webinar. Um, so, so please do get kind of putting things in the chat and the Q&As. So um, thank you. This is our fourth um, Lepada Leaders webinar today and um, we, we kind of strayed out of the cities a little bit um, with Sandy Nen last week looking at National Trust and other properties but now we've gone deep into the countryside uh, and away from London and today's webinar uh, is focused on um, country estates really. So um, I want to introduce you first to James Peel uh, who's the curator at Goodwood um, and uh, he has been there since 2009, um, grew up in the Welsh Marches I believe, uh, read History of Art at Edinburgh so there's a kind of a nod to Scotland uh, that will get more about and was a director at Christie's um, specializing in, in furniture there. Uh, he's also written a number of books and uh, I think we might have uh, be sort of treated to a taste of one that's currently on sale at the moment a bit later as we go on. Um, and then we'll move on to Scott. One of the things that both James and uh, Scott share is they're both from the kind of uh, other sides of the auction houses. So we've got kind of Christie's with James and then we're going to Sotheby's with Scott. Um, so Scott McDonald is the Head of Conservation and Collections for the BQ Estate and actually there's a number of properties that are part of that which I'll let Scott uh, talk about because it kind of strays into different territories. Um, and he was a valuer in the Bond Street Valuations Department specialising in the heritage collections and um, that means sort of house sales and things like that. Uh, is also a vetter um, at some of the kind of established fairs that sadly we can't see or visit at the moment. <laughs> Um, and in 2016, he kind of hot-footed it out of London uh, and started in his post now. So um, welcome, both of you, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I, I thought what I'd do is start by a kind of a fairly sort of generic open question, which is probably got quite a lot of uh, answers. Um, and I'll ask each of you that. And then as we go through, um, we'll kind of you know, um, address each of you, but please do kind of follow in. If you have a, a point that you want to interject, then then please do. It's it's a fluid kind of fireside or, or uh, chat, which really isn't, as we know, we're all on kind of laptops. Um, so uh, starting with you, Scott, what do you see as the future for stately homes? Um, particularly given that we're going to have to implement social distancing. And I suppose by that, perhaps we should be looking at the kind of next six months as a future, and then also further down the line, perhaps in six years. So the sort of near and the far future. Gosh. Um, <laughs> it's a big one. <laughs> um, well, I think in the next six months, the, the, the um, immediate future, we've taken a decision, as many houses have, to close uh, all together really for this year and we won't reopen the actual houses for tours or, or groups until the Easter of next year. Um, I think uh, there will be a bigger focus on the outdoors of course and um, we'll be, we're hoping to open the gardens and the parks of all the houses in, uh, in July in Scotland for two months and down here at Bowton which is where I'm based at the moment in Northamptonshire, um, we will 
be open for a month uh, um, in August. Um, you know, we're fortunate. We, you know, we as as an organisation, we um, have always encouraged people to use the gardens and the parks, and we'll have to be uh, conscious of social distancing. Unfortunately, there won't be any uh, lavatories or anything in the normal sense, but we will have to lose and it's amazing all the things one has to think about uh, putting in place but we're confident that we can provide a safe uh, relaxed environment for people uh, outside through this through the summer um, looking to the future the, the, the longer uh, distance really it's slightly unknown I would think that um, you know there'll be an increased emphasis on online bookings I think there'll be possibly smaller groups, family groups, almost private tour situations, um, because of course our, our guides are also vulnerable and, and must be looked after and we might, must make sure that the environments are safe for them to. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, perhaps we look to take the collections away from the houses and out to to people in terms of presentations and, and that sort of thing. But then you're getting away from, you know, the attraction of coming to the country house, which is seeing collections in the context for which they were, they were collected. Mm. Thank you. And do you um, think that there'll be quite, I mean, obviously there's an economic impact, but are you able to kind of mitigate, mitigate against that at the moment or? Uh, I wouldn't say we're able to mitigate the furlough scheme uh, we have used to a degree, but we have many people uh, working from home and of course those who work on the estates in farming and forestry and, and in the gardens and things are able to do so safely with the, you know, the, the relevant um, uh, precautions put in place. Um, I think there will be an enormous knock-on effect to my team, particularly all of whom have been working from home, um, we we will see a decrease in our collections conservation spend of uh, up to seventy five percent this year, and um, that's not so much because of the visitor numbers. You know, we we because of the the nature of the houses and the fact that so many of them are are quite remote, our visitor numbers have never been huge, and and so we've never. Uh, it's never been something upon which we've become dependent. And uh, But the other areas, forestry, agriculture, commercial and domestic, property rental, these kind of things, um, the various businesses that, that we work with, um, all of those will be badly affected and, um, yeah, will have an up-on effect on us. Thank you, Scott. And so, so James, um, the same question to you. And I, I suppose it's probably quite good to um, wrap into this, the, some of the differences that maybe an estate like Goodwood might have to the Bukulu estates in terms of... Yes, so, so Goodwood uh, is, is pretty well totally dependent on the events. And without the main events, the, there's a huge source of revenues completely dried up. So I think uh, that's the sort of biggest challenge. And the government furlough scheme has been a huge lifesaver uh, in terms of, of really keeping the estate going. So out of a total workforce of around 750, nearly uh, 600 are on, on furlough. So it's been, a, it's been a, an amazing um, help. But I think the, 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 the main thing is that a place like Goodwood uh, is, it's it, the house opening side is a very small part of it. We get around five, six thousand visitors a year, um, but the events bring in sort of half a million people. So without those events, uh, it's a very, very, very different place. Uh, and Goodwood's all, always been about welcoming people in, sharing uh, the surroundings, the house, the race course, the motor circuit. Uh, and it's so it's um, it's a hard place to be in at the moment without being able to welcome all those friends into Goodwood. And when do you think? Uh, have, I mean, obviously, sort of looking at, at the government plans at the moment and the slow kind of opening and starting outside. Do you, have you been kind of talking about when you might be able to open 
good word there's in no, any shape or form? There's no, there, there's no plans as yet. I think um, so from, from Goodwood's perspective, opening the house actually costs money. So we don't make a profit from opening the house. But there are other events that go on in the house. And until there's more gu guidance on weddings and events, then the house will have to remain shut, um, which is a sad thing. But I think a lot of privately owned country houses, there's um, 1,500 houses in the Historic Houses organisation, and a huge number of those are dependent on weddings and events. Uh, and without though that source of income, um, it's really looking pretty bleak. Uh, so I think the, the main thing is to get some kind of timeline from the government as to when those events can take place and then houses can start opening up again. Um, continuing on from that and to James and then we'll go to Scott. Just thinking, you mentioned the furlough scheme. Um, the, in terms of the just sort of being a lifeline really and, and it, it's a, been a lifeline I think to, to many businesses particularly in the arts and the heritage and entertainment sector but do you um, think that are there other measures that, that uh, they've put in place that are particularly helpful to you and other things that could be done better as well looking at maybe other nations? Um, I think I think the, the thing that's places like Goodwood are crying out for is we all want to know when's it going to end uh, which is the which is the impossible question um, and I think that I think particularly for events any any house having events would just love to know uh, what's in the government's mind are you are you are we thinking six months ahead are we thinking a year ahead or are you thinking a month ahead so uh, that that I think would be really helpful to know yeah, I, and I think, uh, is it, correct me if I'm wrong, but have they um, kind of done something so that in terms of the sort of open days that you have to have as an estate to get the tax breaks, has that been kind of had some form of relief for this year? So, yeah, so that's been relaxed. So, so normally uh, a lot of country houses like Goodwood would have to be open for a set number of days per year to fulfil their tax obligations. So for instance, Goodwood has to be open for 60 days every year in the spring and the summer. And a lot of the art hanging on the walls is tax exempt. But they have said that the government have said that we don't have to open at present this year. Uh, and because the oh, there is obviously restrictions in place. So that has taken a huge sort of burden off our backs. So we're not sort of thinking, gosh, as soon as restrictions lift, we're going to have to do our 60 days, that there has been some flexibility built into that. And a lot of, well, I say a lot, but several houses have already said, we're not going to open at all during 2020. And uh, that for various reasons, but it does mean that people have that option, that if they can afford to do that, that they don't have to open. I'm sure is a great relief um, to many and and for Scott for, for you because it's so much more of a kind of diverse portfolio in terms of the sort of government support um, for you has that been effective and is there sort of again I mean obviously we all want to know when we return to normal but are there some other areas as well where you could get some more support do you think or guidance? Um, it's not not to my knowledge, not thus far. Um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, various avenues are being explored, but as you rightly say, we're fortunate in having a very diverse portfolio and streams of revenue come in from all sorts of different places. Um, you know, hydroelectric schemes and, and controversial wind farms, I suppose, and things like that. Um, there's, a, there's a huge range of different uh, things. So that, that that helps us hugely, but um, you know, we are anticipating, as I said before, uh, uh, a huge knock-on effect with many of the businesses and and uh, revenue streams that I mentioned. And so I think, uh, you know, we of course we're anticipating a, basically a, a hard time. I, th I think many other houses, you know, I, I 
particularly worry about smaller houses, which, you know, close to big centres of population where they are very dependent, heavily dependent on visitor numbers. And, and um, I would imagine that historic houses are, are in talks with the government as to how those houses can be buoyed up because it's an extremely worrying time for them. And actually just thinking about that in, in terms of sort of what we might learn through this kind of new age, are there areas that you can see that stately homes um, could look at to diversify their offering, maybe to boost their income? And Scott first, and then we'll go to you, James. Just, yeah, without, you... without a doubt. Um, you know, in fact, I was just speaking yesterday to um, our head of parks here, and I think, you know, I think a lot of people will start to look at, you know, seriously look at making commercial um, decisions over things like, uh, you know, farms producing local produce for local people, um, engage, you know, farm shops and things where people don't need to travel so far. Um, they know where it's come from. It's, it's organic. That's, we, we haven't explored that nearly to the extent that we, that we hope to. And, and I think many other houses will be looking at that and how we, we better or more effectively use the the outdoors uh, on the on the estates. You know, we're very lucky at the moment. We have, um, you know, the thirty five thousand visitors a year. That's across the three main country houses, um, and as I say, there some some of those are quite remote. Um, but we, with especially up north, with the right to roam, you know, people have wonderful access to the countryside and to our estates. And I think it would be our hope that we can further develop that sensitively. And and James, in terms of sort of diversification, obviously, you know, as you said, Goodwood is, is heavily sort of reliant on events, whether it's weddings or whether it's the Festival of Speed, which is a lovely event that I've enjoyed a few times. Um, but are there areas that, that you can look to diversify? And maybe some of that is, is bringing the collection online or what are there sort of plans afoot that you're... Yeah, I think I think one thing it's done is it sort of pressed fast forward on the whole digital area. So a lot of um, a lot of our events, the the last few years, there's been a huge push to make the digital coverage really exciting and uh, in some cases interactive. And I, what this has done has basically forced Goodwood's hand to increase that offering. And there's a huge global audience out there. And if you can capture that, you, you can really um, spread the word uh, about the event. So it's not just being there, but it's being online as well in all, literally every corner of the world. People are tuning in to the Festival of Speed, the Good of Revival. And I think uh, it's in many ways, it's forced our hand but also shown that there is an audience there and there are people willing to engage online uh, and enjoy as much as they do when they actually come as well. So you might you do that with sort of bite size how, how's that going to play out have you kind of got ideas in terms of yes. content and things? So actually just just before lockdown we were planning to do um, a series of small bite size videos where you can um, click on a link and you have a sort of one minute, highly curated, beautifully filmed uh, discussion on a particular work of art in the collection. And the idea was that people would be able to sort of access it on Instagram and access it on the website. So rather than having to take themselves on a journey, like a virtual tour through a museum where you're sort of clicking with your mouse and going from room to room. This is a one minute, gives you the bullet points, but also looks beautiful. And the curator has actually told you exactly what it's about. They've selected the piece, why it's relevant to a collection like Goodwood. So uh, literally, again, it was just before uh, lockdown, we'd just taken on a new person to help with our social media and a new um, videographer to do film work. And I think the timing was just right because they, they've come into their own during this time. Um, but that's something that we'll definitely be doing to look to, to broaden the reach of the collection through social media and, and videoing. 
Thank you. And, and Scotty, are you kind of looking at virtual um, ways of showing the collection or do you have some other ideas about how to kind of um, give people access to the collections, I suppose? I mean, like in terms of maybe higher education or, or some other elements? I mean, we, we're certainly looking at the digital options. We always have to be mindful of security and intrusiveness in terms of uh, filming and things. But what James is describing is really very interesting and taking in individual items from the collections and, and, and studying those um, appropriately. I mean, a lot of museums, of course, are already doing this kind of thing and doing it brilliantly. And I would, I would, maybe it's my Scottish negativity coming through, but as I, I would say, um, you know, we have to think about the smaller houses as well because it's expensive to explore these kind of options. We, we as an organisation are very, very focused on, um, you know, looking to what we do post lockdown and um, projects wise, we'll be looking at, at conservation projects where we want consistency. Uh, here we're working on nine ceilings by Louis Chalon and uh, conserving those uh, each year. And the team who work on that uh, are, are a, a very narrow, in a very narrow field. And so one of our worries is that those skills sort of evaporate as people go and find work in other areas and, and or even, you know, some of them come from other countries, they go home to look after family members or whatever it might be. So we want to try to continue where possible those kind of projects. And as you say, to focus very much on educational and research initiatives with, with various collaborations with external bodies and, and, and um, also opening up our archives uh, to, to the public to a greater extent, you know, in an appropriate way, but we only have limited resources. Where. And, and talking, I mean, you've mentioned the sort of the particular problem of some of the smaller houses and how they might kind of continue. Yeah. Um, do you think that, that actually the way is kind of, you know, sort of better together? And can you see that some of these organisations should collaborate together? Is, is that possible or is it too spread out to be able to do no, that? I think it's perfectly possible. Uh, you know, James and I are part of a, an organisation which is called the Private Curators um, the private collections rather curators group has just been started we've had only a couple of meetings but it is an attempt to engage with other people because as curators i think james would probably agree that we have so traditionally been in our little bubbles and and uh, not perhaps looked outwardly um and worked you know reached out to other houses and i think that's something we both um want to do through whichever vehicles we can develop with that yeah do you want to add to that james in terms of how that might play out yeah i um as scott was saying it, it's only just been set up but okay. <laughs> i think we we uh, i think what came out of it was that a lot of us who are working in country houses felt that we were working almost in isolation uh and we're, we're quite a rare breed country house curators uh, but what was what was interesting was that there's there's since then there's been a lot of shared best practice and whereas before you might think oh gosh who am I going to get to restore this rare piece of um, horse bridle that was um, used by the Duke of Monmouth uh, you can now chat to your colleagues and uh, actually someone can very sensibly say well we had some 17th century leather work restored by this person so that's that's been a really positive thing also i think the having um a friend in a pray in a place does make a huge difference and when it comes to making loans um it's very helpful to ring someone up and say are you loaning to this exhibition what what do you feel about it um, but it, it, what we haven't done yet, which might come out of it, is loan works from one house to another. And particularly with a lot of the larger houses, there are already links between the families, friendships between the families that own them. But that might actually result in quite interesting exhibitions where loans are from, say, 
Annick Castle, where uh, a previous um, Duchess of Northumberland grew up at Goodwood. So th that's just an example, but there's a fabulous portrait of her. Wouldn't it be fun to bring that portrait to Goodwood, the home where she spent so much of her early years? Um, but that's just, that's just an example that is the sort of thing that um, might grow out of this uh, activity between the curators um, and in many cases, the owners as well. And I suppose what that would do as well is that if you're, you know, because it's kind of um, looking after a sort of a regional or local audience and, and a hyper local audience that that gives a, a reason for people to come back and repeat visit as well, which can be so critical to some of the smaller museums. Um, just kind of following on from that, do you see this kind of the crisis might change how um, country um, homes or stately homes might be curated in the future? I suppose in terms of how people would walk through as well. I think the James, sorry, and then we'll get to <laughs> Yeah, I think I think a lot of um a lot of our visitors come for an experience and particularly um the last couple of years they've been coming, we give them a wonderful tea in the ballroom with um which has got waiters and waitresses and it's a it's a wonderful experience and part of that experience is having a tour of the house and the collection. So there is already that offering, but that can always be increased. So you can have certain, you could have certain days when particular areas of the collection are focused on. So there's a reason to come on that day. And it particularly, as you say, if you're local, there's a reason to come back. So lots of people visit a house and that's it. But if there's a new exhibition, a new tour that, for instance, talks about Canaletto's views of London, that it does actually give a, a, a better reason to come back again. Um, so I think, yes, there are, there are ways that we might have to be a bit more inventive to draw people back through the doors. And th so moving on to Scott, do you have some comments on this? And I, and I think also then maybe going into how maybe the curator might change in the long term. Yes, well, I mean, I agree with uh, all that James has to say there. Um, I think from, from how we might change, uh, we will, I think, possibly have to engage further with the public, you know, to go out more rather than stay um, within the collections. And I think we'll, well, you know, to give presentations, to, to sell what we have at the houses and the history that um, all of these objects hinge upon, you know. Um, that's the wonderful thing about visiting these country houses is, as I mentioned earlier, they have this wonderful context. And um, so to try to impart that uh, to people and encourage them to, um, to visit howsoever that visit takes place uh, is yet, you know, to be sort of sculpted, if you like. And I'm, I'm just thinking in terms of how um, the, the country houses are kind of staffed by either sort of paid guides or volunteers, um, it may be kind of a, a wrong impression, but from certainly, you know, when I go around, I feel like there's quite a few people maybe in the retirement and a little bit older category. Mm -hmm. um, is, is what's going on now sort of impacting that, do you think, in terms of how volunteers... Um, and, and paid guides might be there. Will you kind of need to recruit more, um, Scott? And, I think and um, you know, like we're we're lucky. We've got a we've got a our guides and people are recruited from all sorts of age groups. Um, but you're right. Uh, some people who uh, work for us part time and that sort of thing are 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 retired, and um, we will have to plan how we do that. That's why I'm saying that. Perhaps it will be that that visits take on a, a more, more of a sort of private flavour, if you like, much smaller groups, and um, and that people uh, are selected for those tours carefully uh, to to work with certain types of people or whatever it might be. But um, the I don't see that we will be changing our staffing uh, imminently. You know what. What I'm saying is we're just taking every 
it's sort of every week as it comes, uh, like yeah. everyone else. And um, uh, for now, we're sticking with the people who have been um, been with us for so long, and, and we don't see that changing. Um, yeah, no, I, I suppose what I, I didn't mean sort of it changing and unsettling. I suppose what I meant was that lots of people are kind of questioning what they want to do. Quite a few people are wanting to spend more time outside of the cities. And I, I feel that there might be some people who actually want to kind of get involved and and especially if they've been passionate. I know from my conversations at the Foundling Museum, um, there were sort of patrons and, and members who'd been paying who suddenly wanted to kind of come in and help as guides because they're so passionate about that museum mm. um, that you, you might have a kind of um, some supporters there who want to get involved. Yes, well, I, I hope we do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. Um, so James, I mean, we all want to come for, a, for a, a cream tea if we can. That sounds absolutely heavenly. Um, I suppose one of the ways that, you know, stately homes may be able to open again is to kind of keep building, as Scott mentioned, these smaller groups of, of a visitor experience. Are there some other things that you could maybe do that create small, uh, unique experiences for people in terms of maybe their tastes, um, interests, or, or um, yeah. Yes, I think, well, we've certainly always had uh, groups visiting and specialist groups, and um, as far as possible, we'll tailor, tailor, tailor the tour if they're from the French Porcelain Society, they'll spend most of their time in the card room looking at the Cerberus. So uh, I'm sure if if we are approached by groups um, that we we can certainly be, be flexible. I think that the groups are actually going to, that's going to be the challenge because when you've got um, the house open, if you've got individuals walking around, then you can have people socially distanced. It's when you start having large groups squeezing through doors and passing another group in the corridor that's that that's going to be the challenge and it might be that we'll have to steward the rooms to begin with and uh have a have a have a timed system where people can go into the main house what what we're fortunate at goodwood is that there's lots and lots of exits out of the house uh to the exterior so um, we we have got that ability to be flexible, and another area that we haven't yet gone down, which I know a lot of the larger um, stately homes, is the audio tour, where um, it's, it, it's it's essentially you that you can use an audio tour to send someone on their own around around an exhibition. So that might be something particularly for us to to look into. Um, and Scott, my, I don't. Do you offer audio tours and kind of curated experiences we, like that to date? We never have before, but of course, it is something we'll be looking at. Um, I think, you know, we've we've always felt that the that you know, as as James has done in the past, the, the personal touch of of having uh, a tour and given by someone, and where questions and answers can be given. Uh, is a nice one and actually there is a feeling in some quarters that audio tours can um, can detract from what you're looking at because you're you know you're being fed the information rather than trying to absorb what's there but I think the change in circumstances will certainly prompt us to start to look at these kind of um, technological aids. And, and just thinking, I mean, obviously, one of the things, you know, there's some key differences. I mean, it's obvious, but sort of a stately home to a museum. And you talked about context. But, you know, many of these um, homes are, are, you know, part lived in, part not. Uh, with, with what's going on at the moment, have you had big, um, you know, you mentioned a restoration project. Have you had sort of big conservation or restoration projects which have had to go on hold during this? Um, first to Scott and then. Yes, we did. I mean, we've we've had um, we've had big st structural uh, projects going on here at Bison, um, and obviously um, we've had to put those on hold. We're hoping that they'll start up again. They relate to the roofs here, and um, so 
to my point of view, making sure the building's fabric is sound is, is so critical because everything that sits beneath it is dependent on that. Um, so um, there have been uh, certainly uh, halts in what we've been doing there, um, but we hope very much that we can, uh, with the right safeguards in place, that we can start most of those up again. And, um, and here, the big ceiling project, I'm very much hoping we'll get on with that in the autumn if we can, um, uh, again, taking all the safety considerations into account. And for, for your big ceiling project then, so, you, so how, how have you kind of gathered the people together, obviously specialists, but have, have you got a university attached to that as well or not? Or? No, not at the no. moment. We have been looking for um, uh, an educational um, or research uh, yeah. plant, if you like, on the ceilings, but we started, there are nine of these ceilings. We're going to be tackling one a year. Um, we, 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 you know, we, we talked to various specialists in this kind of area and we selected one and they put together a team of people whose work we knew from other houses and other projects. Um, so they, you know, and they have all committed to, to returning in the autumn all being well. And James, sort of as curator at Goodwood, were there some things that you're kind of itching to get your hands on that have had to kind of be paused during lockdown? So we're, there were a few projects that were, we already had out with conservators, so um, that they've been able to continue with those. But I, the, the reality is that any future projects will, will have to be put on pause. Um, and obviously that's frustrating but the the, the main thing is that um, the welfare of, of all the staff and keeping keeping the place going at a lot of places not just large places but country houses in general are they have a whole whole community dependent on them mm -hmm. so um, when 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 you're talking about a uh, a furniture restorer or a textile conservator it's I think it's important to still keep drip feeding them work because their whole livelihood might depend on it so as far as possible we'll we'll keep going even if it's on a small scale yeah on the, on those little projects I don't um, know sorry go, ahead, Scott. go on go I just didn't know if James is in the same boat as we are but we have been lending very heavily over the last few years and, and we've got several things sort of stranded at various exhibitions <laughs> and, uh, and I would just like to say how uh, refreshingly, uh, wonderfully supportive the museum staff have been in communicating to us all along because some of these things of course are critical to our collections here in various houses and we miss them but um, they've been feeding us information and updates all the way along and I'm sure a lot of people must be in the same boat as hoping that we can start to see the return of some of those later in the summer but yeah. that certainly these are some projects that have been halted very abruptly yes yeah so we need to start a campaign of help me get home <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So just um, before we kind of go towards some of the questions that are coming in, what I'd love, because the frustrating thing about this webinar is you're both in lovely settings. You've got, you know, many boxes that are intriguing behind you, Scott. You've got a lovely portrait behind you. But what we're missing is going through the estate. So I would like each of you to just kind of tell me the, the place that you kind of... Um, you know give us a sort of a visual description if you like of, of the place that you sort of revel uh in being in in your kind of job to sort of enjoy and reflect so starting with you james so i i i think it it's it's a bit mean of me to say it because it's actually on the private side of goodwood <laughs> but the uh, but we do take groups in there occasionally the large library um it has to be one of the most beautiful rooms in the country and just being in the space and that and I think people often talk about layers of history uh, but in that room there really are layers of history the different architects the books from different generations the portraits the art objects um, and just going into that room and being there at the heart of the house I, I do miss that that's that's my one place that I miss. And is there a picture of it in your book? There is in this book. 
Ah. <laughs> the English country house. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In fact, I could I could show you now for those of you <laughs> the large library. Where is it? He says. He says. <laughs> oh, lovely. Yeah. So. Please, please come and visit and have a private tour. <laughs> <laughs> Shameless. <laughs> I know. Well, I think there's another book. But Jay, why don't you show us your other book that's yes, out in all good stores in paperback now? So that, so this is um, this came out last year. This yeah. is um, called Glorious Goodwood: A Biography of England's Greatest Sporting Estate, uh, which has got some lots of fun reading with some lots of colour plates, and it's just about to come out in paperback. Uh, in a couple of weeks time so this is a shameless advert for your um, English beach reading when you can eventually get to the English beaches you really want to have a paperback that's the one Free, I we will put a link uh, Scott what about you what, take us somewhere to one of one of the houses or to one of your kind of favorite places give us a little I didn't realize I was going to be appearing on QVC, but um, <laughs> <laughs> we've got, um, I mean, we've got books, our house guides here. I don't know if you can see that uh, there on Bowson. Yeah. And then one each on, on Bow Hill, uh, because these houses are relatively little known, you know, by many people outside of their immediate overall. Um, and Drumlander, I'm at, I've got two spaces. My, one of my favourites is here about in the, up in the attics, which are uh, 17th century, um, so atmospheric. They've got the original paintwork and you walk from one dusty room to another and they are on the public tour um, and filled with dust sheeted furniture and pictures and things from uh, London houses that were closed up a long time ago. Um, my other favourite really would be at Drumlander Castle where, um, you know, I think to spend time in the morning room or the boudoir there with the staggering views over the hills beyond and the forests and the rivers uh, is a really special place too. Well, we hope that we'll be able to come soon. Well, very much so. 2021 or to the so um just that i can see that there are a few questions in that have come in um Gillian, have you selected um one or two to ask yeah sure um why don't we start with um do you have advice for smaller stately homeowners as to how they can preserve and showcase their collections with very limited funds I would um, suggest that you um, or they make contact with our private curators uh, group, the private collections curators group, and they're a group of about 40 um, curators from, from country houses, small and large. Unfortunately, it's so early that um, we don't even have a website yet, but perhaps if you left your details with um, the PADA, and contacted us through them, uh, we could help. Um, I think we're going to, it's going to be a huge time of change for us all. Um, but I think you have to, there's a tremendous amount of experience in a group like that. And, um, and I'm sure it's really a lot of the time about being put in touch with the right people who can advise you and who have been through the same thing before. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want me, to, yeah, do you want me yeah. to give another one? So this one um, is for James. It says, okay. with your new digital offering, have you thought about private online tours of specific collections for, for a small group of friends, for example, or are you doing something like this already? So no, we're not doing that. And that would, that would be a wonderful thing to do. Uh, as soon as we can get back into these houses uh, to offer online tours. I, I think what the what lockdown has shown is that there is an audience for this type of panel discussion 
and interviews and a lot of uh, lectures that were planned to take place in London have suddenly become available on Zoom. So they, they've become much more popular than they've ever been before. And I think the same can be, could be transferred to, to the tours of country houses. Yeah, that would be a wonderful idea. Do you think that you might consider that as well, Scott, in terms of online virtual tours for? Yeah, yeah very much. Um, again, okay. I, would, I would say about the security aspects and things like that, but yes, we would love to do that kind of thing. Fantastic. Well, before we go, I've got, I'm going to do some thank yous, but I've got one more little question to ask each of you, which is not a very serious one. I just want to know what your lockdown pleasure, because, you know, there's been a lot of very depressing, very upsetting things that have been going on. But I think some people have all kind of found with uh, with this sort of isolation that there are there have been some sort of things that they can indulge in as well. So, Scott, to you. Um, my lockdown pleasure uh, was very uninspiringly the garden and uh, it was my uh, you know that was my savior i worked out, out there i'm very lucky to have a garden in yorkshire and um i i concentrated my efforts there it's it's uh, never looked very good it still doesn't look particularly good but it looks a lot better than it did and james have you found time for something particular as well so well i've got four small daughters so it's homeschooling <laughs> homeschooling but also it's just been wonderful to spend time with them um and i have indulged in um quite a lot of instagram which i probably i had to set myself a time limit because it was getting out of control <laughs> it has been it has been fun to be able to indulge in that have the time to do that well thank you thank you so much to both of you for giving up your time for us this morning um uh, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to both of you and I just, you know, want to come and, and have a look round um, uh, when we can. Uh, so it's, it's sort of deeply frustrating, but I do hope, I think you're right, that the kind of being able to get into parklands and, and visit gardens and everything, I think will be people's sort of uh, cultural pleasure for the next few months. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you too to Cultural Communications for kind of bringing us all together and to Gillian, uh, who's the Lepada Marketing Manager, who's been kind of making everything happen in the background. So um, we haven't got one scheduled for next week, but we will be putting some others, uh, Lepada Leaders um, webinars in the programme soon. So thank you uh, for your time and goodbye for today. Bye. 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 Bye.